And I can see that some people. Okay. All right. So I'm going to do a beam design uh, in there. So this is going to be, uh, I suppose, third year plus. So we're going to recap on third year and um, and um, do a little bit extra than that. So as I said, the two main uh, additions that we're going to do this year for beam design uh, in the steel component is that we are going to consider that the beam is not restrained along its length um, so that it can laterally um, buckle so they can come up sideways as well as bending uh, down the way like in this case here on the bottom uh, it also can uh, bend up sideways as well so we're going to have a look at that um, and we're also going to look at say locally so for example in this uh, image here we have a beam the spanning between uh, two supports so one support a pen support on the left hand side a roller support on the right hand side span l it's got a force uh, or a point load a concentrated load at bit span uh, f uh, and then we should be able to draw a bending moment diagram for that and a, a shear force diagram uh, for that uh, beam and then when we do that uh, design and check say locally under f here we might check to see uh, the stresses due to the bending we might want to check the stresses due to shear and it may end up being that um, the beam is mainly okay um, along most of its length, but some of it might need to uh, be stiffened up or, or made a little bit stronger. So we can put stiffeners uh, in there to, to improve it. So we're going to learn how to design those stiffeners as well. So that's the, um, that's the, the I suppose, the main um, two additions onto the beam design. So we're going to start with the beam design and then uh, later on then we'll also do plate girder design. So instead of having a rolled section uh, where the section comes out of the machine fully rolled, uh, hot rolled, that we're going to make up the beam uh, by welding plates together. So that's a plate girder that we're going to learn how to design. And that's the, the three, I suppose, new elements into uh, beam design. So as I said, we'll uh, we'll recap on third year. So beams and beam theory. Um, we're going to look again using the error code 3 um, in 1993, follow the codified design for bending. Um, and uh, we're going to do an example that we don't need stiffeners, an example that we do need stiffers and stiffeners, and then uh, hopefully next week we'll move on um, to um, looking at the torsional buckling. So beams are intended to span across two or more supports to just transmit loads mainly uh, by bending action. So we have a beam here. That beam uh, will have a load coming on it, so either a concentrated load uh, like F or some sort of a distributed load. It could be a uniformly distributed load or it could be non-uniformly distributed load. It could have multiple loads on it, not just one concentrated load, it could have multiple uh, loads on it. So, for example, we could have like, five people standing along here. That would be five different uh, concentrated loads along with it. And then we need to get that load from the beam. Uh, let's just imagine that this is a timber plank that we're standing on, that I'm standing in the middle of it. I want to get that load safely. Uh, into the two supports so I don't fall, it doesn't break or, um, or deform too much that I fall into the water that's underneath it. We can use lots of different types of uh, beams, so I don't know if there's going to be uh, that clear on your computers there. Uh, lots of different types, different shapes uh, of, of beams uh, in there, so if we have a really short span we, we can use angle sections, uh, they are oftentimes are cold formed, so how you, cold form means that if you start with a flat plate and then you bend up the side, bend up the other side, um, in it you get a cold, it, it'll uh, form the shape. So it's cold form because we don't heat it up uh, in there, so you use angle sections or purling sections and so on uh, in there. So they're, uh, um, they're typically kind of three to six or four to eight meters for these cold form sections. So the typical place where you see this type of section uh, would be on an industrial shed uh, where you have your primary steel uh, beams um, that are uh, are, the, are the steel frame of the structure uh, and then sitting on top of that you have these cold form sections that are spanning uh, in between often kind of five seven maybe eight meters uh, in between the the main uh, primary steel and then sitting on top of this uh, element would uh, sit the, the, the sheeting uh, in it so let me see I might be able to draw on top of this uh, so you would have a a, a insulated sheet that's on top so that's the roof uh, on top of it Okay, so that's the roof that sits on top of it, and then underneath, uh, underneath this guy here, you would have a, a standard uh, steel beam. Okay. And then you'd have another purlin. Um, uh, then you have another purlin. So that's one purlin. The other purlin here uh, might be uh, two and a half, three meters apart, and so on and so on over through it. 
Um, last year we designed a lot of um, roll sections, uh, hot roll sections with UV uh, in there, and they're the most uh, frequently uh, used types of sections uh, in there. So they can span somewhere between one and, and 30 meters in, in length. Uh, we use U, uh, UKBs and UKCs, uh, so that stands for uni uh, UB is a universal beam, and the UK is because they're mainly from the UK or they were originally um, specified in the UK. Uh, across the continent in Europe, you might use HEAs, HEBs, and HEMs, so they're kind of equivalent, or IPEs, which are more cylinder elements as well. So they're different uh, sections. So you can find kind of equivalent HEAs or HEBs or HEMs uh, to our own uh, UBs and, and UCs that we would typically specify in Ireland. You can also um, use castellated um, uh, sections, so where you kind of weld two sections together and you have a, an opening here uh, in the middle, um, or they also um, set, called cellular beams. It can be a circular um, opening or they can be uh, different different shapes of openings in there. Uh, the advantage of that is what's well, the reason why you have the openings is that you can pass the services through. So you can pass the ducting through, to sends the air around the building, or uh, water pipes for hot and cold water, um, or um, electrical um, conduits or um, cable trains for all the electrical wires and so on uh, going through. Uh, plate girders, so I learned how to design plate girders, so normally they're from 10 up to 100 meters, often used in bridges, car parks, things like that. Um, they're welded, made by welding plates together, usually at least three plates, so we have a, a flange here, we have a bottom flange, and we have a, a web. So, so it's a good advantage of this is you can make it any height you want because you just uh, specify whatever height you want of the, of the web. Um, you can have any thickness you want uh, in terms of the thickness of the web, top flange or bottom flange. You can have the top flange to be a different size than the bottom flange in terms of its width uh, and in terms of its uh, thickness. So it gives you a lot of flexibility in design of plate girders. You can also have plate girders where you uh, have uh, cellular um, holes in them as well. So you can see that the computer lab and the Alice Perry Engineering Building on the ground floor, if you look up, you can see um, some plate girders with some holes uh, punched in the middle of them there, now with the service pass, pass through them. Uh, we can have trusses, so we would have designed trusses um, last, last year uh, in the roof design, and there it would span kind of similar to a uh, plate girder, usually 10 to 100 metres we use, uh, we use trusses uh, in there, and they're made up of cords and diagonals, they're fabricated from tubes or sections or hot rolled uh, sections in there. So. Each of those elements that make up the truss uh, are pre predominantly loaded in axial load only, whereas in the in the in the beam, uh, typically it's in, in bending. And then we kind of box guard or something like here on the bottom, which is typically used for um, bridges. It's fabricated from plates and usually stiffened uh, in there. So you have a you have a, a plates come together to make it, and then you might have stiffeners along here on the top uh, to, so that you don't get uh, local buckling. So used for crane rails, bridge decks, and so on because it's high. Uh, torsional properties because it's a box so uh, it's hard to uh, uh, twist it around in torsion and it's good stiffness properties uh, as well so oh, sorry okay um so this beam section is over beams that are uh, laterally restrained uh, in it so on the bottom here it's a, it's a laterally unrestrained beam which we're going to cover uh, later on so just for for the first lecture we're going to cover, assume that it's laterally restrained. So that means that it, it cannot buckle laterally, uh, i.e. the failure by member buckling is observed by the rest of the members. So again, imagine that you get your ruler, you squash your ruler uh, out, uh, and then you can see that buckling sideways, because the member is in compression, it's going to buckle out sideways. That's similar to the top flange of the beam uh, down here. So this top flange of the beam, as it's, uh, as it's in bending, as we bend down, or we, we load it down there from the top, um, or we twist the ends um, to put a moment on both ends, that's going to make it bend down the way. Um, but as it also bends down the way, the bottom flange here is in tension, so that's been stretched. The top flange here is in compression, that's been squashed. Imagine your ruler, you're squashing your ruler. Uh, and then that can also, as well as going down the way, it also can move out the way as well. Uh, so the, whereas the bottom flange because it's in tension it only goes straight down the way so that's this one here is directly underneath uh, this one here so okay so uh so that's called uh, lateral uh, torsional buckling um and for beams that is a concern if we can't restrain the top flange so we don't need to worry about the bottom flange uh, in, when it's in this shape because that's not going to move sideways because it's in tension uh, but we do need to worry about the top flange that may end up uh, buckling sideways if we don't restrain it 
So lateral torsion in buckling is characterized by twisting and lateral deflection of a beam that's subject to bending about its major axis in there. And you can go onto YouTube and have a look at uh, some uh, videos there. So we're going to cover that lateral torsion in buckling in the second topic. For the cases with no lateral torsion in buckling, uh, bending strength may be uh, assessed on the basis of in-plane cross-sectional resistance. So we look at, at the cross-sectional resistance uh, in-plane. Local buckling is still an issue. So um, here's a beam that's been uh, bended. So this is a, a concrete slab sitting on top of it. Uh, there's the web, top flange, bottom flange. So in this case, the bottom flange again is in tension, so stretched. Uh, so we, when we load it with the concrete and with loads on top, pushing down top of the concrete, uh, it makes it bend. The bottom flange goes into tension. Uh, top flange goes into compression. And then as that goes into compression, you can see some local buckles uh, along here and along uh, here. And so we have to still uh, check that. So we check local buckling. So if you remember from uh, your third year steel design course, we check that local buckling at the top uh, under compression. We also check local buckling for the uh, web as well. Uh, in it. And from that, then we classify the section. So is it class one, class two, class three, or class four? So basically, class one can um, develop full uh, plasticity without uh, being susceptible to local buckling. Uh, whereas if you take something like class three, you'll get local buckling uh, just around the yield point. Uh, whereas class four, you're going to end up getting local buckling in the elastic range. So in other words, um, the uh, you get buckling, but the uh, before you hit, hit the yield point of the of the material. Okay, so, so cross-section classification is a very important design step for beams and bending, uh, as it was for the compression members. So this is uh, how we classify the section. So this is a plot of moment uh, versus uh, rotation. So if I had a, a, a beam and I put a, a, uh, a moment on the end of it, so a moment on one end and a moment on the other end, so there's a couple there on the beam. Uh, and then that beam is going to deflect down. Okay. And then uh, how much that deflects down by? That angle here. And deflects down by. That's theta. Okay, so that's the angle theta. This is the moment that we're putting on the end. Okay. And then this example here, uh, if I look at the O... Oh, I look at the bending moment diagram for this one. So there's the bending moment diagram. So it's constant. So there's a moment here. That's M, and a moment on the other side. So it's a constant moment because we have uh, we've applied a couple on one side, a couple on the other side. So there, uh, it's a constant moment going across it. Um, so it's a constant bending moment across that. It causes the beam um, to deflect like this. Uh, and then the rotation at the very end uh, is theta. So if I plot that rotation at the uh, of the beam, which is the moment, that's the rotation, against the moment that's applied, so that's the moment, and in this case, we have a uniform moment right across the beam. Um, then uh, in, initially, as I, as I rotated, so I've got my ruler again in my hand, as I rotate it around uh, in there, so I'm twisting my uh, two hands, one uh, counterclockwise and one clockwise, that's bending down the, the beam. Um, so that uh, angle that is twisting that at the end, that's theta. Um, how much um, uh, moment I'm applying at the end um, is on it. So when I do a little bit uh, at the beginning, I'm in the elastic range. So as I take my ruler and I twist the ends of it, it bends down. Uh, and then as I, uh, if I release that moment, take the moment off it, it fully recovers to its original position. Okay, so if I load it, um, it's bending down, I fully release it, it comes back up to its original position. So there, that part of the curve, I'm heading up between um, the origin here. Oh, sorry, I'm heading up from uh, the origin here at the bottom, all the way up to C at the top. So I can load it, uh, unload it, and then fully recover every single time. Okay, so that's the elastic range, up to about uh, C is the elastic range there. Um, as I go, or sorry, B is the elastic range, would say. If I... Um, if I uh, put a larger uh, moment onto it, then I can end up getting into the plastic range. So if I get into the plastic range, like over somewhere like here, uh, and then I um, I can get all the way over, say, here. And then if I unload it, then it unloads uh, back down. So that's the unloading. And then the distance, I'm just going to change the color so I'm not using the same as the background. So that, uh, that unloading, then I get that all the way over here, and that is a permanent 
uh, deformation in there. So that, that distance there is permanent uh, in there. So once I go past the yield part and I unload it, okay, so as I go past the yield part and unload it, so when I get my ruler and if I push that hard enough uh, and go past the yield part and then unload it, it will have a permanent uh, rotation and the permanent rotation at the end of it or the permanent bending in it is, is this amount here, okay. So that was assuming that I could get in, in that example that I just did there, that was assuming that was assuming I could get all the way over here uh, um, and unload it uh, safely without it without it um, failing. Okay. But what may happen is that it may end up getting a uh, local buckle early. So for example, if I have a class four section, uh, I'll only be able to do a certain amount of rotation and then I would get some components will have a local buckle in it. So the top flange of the steel, for example, will have a local buckle in it uh, and then I won't be able to add any more moments. So you can see I can add, not add any more moments as I keep twisting the end of it, rotating it. Um, it takes less and less uh, effort to rotate it uh, until it will eventually uh, break. If I do a class three section, I can get up to a uh, yield, but then local buckle happens. So I'm limited by local buckling. Uh, in there, so I can just about yield the material and then I'm going to start getting local buckling. At class two, I can develop full uh, uh, full elasticity, so I can get up to the end of the elastic range, in other words, the material is starting to yield uh, in that uh, steel, uh, and then I start to um, basically take less effort to be able to um, rotate the, the, the beam. Whereas if I have a class one section, I can develop full elasticity all the way over to the end before then I start to um, before it starts to soften, in other words, before um, it takes less effort um, to rotate the end of it. So I can keep twisting at the end, but I'm using less effort, so I less effort twisting my hands at the end of it. What does that look like in terms of the stress diagram? So on the top here is the stress diagram. So if I'm at point A here, uh, I'm in the elastic range. So it's elastic, so this uh, at the bottom uh, is, F, uh, is the stress. So this is the, the stress here. Okay. So this is a stress at the very outside fiber. So if this is a, a cross-section um, member, so let's say if I get a, just a box section or a box section. So each of those lines, uh, that's the stress at the very, very top. So this is the stress at the very top, whereas we can see at the, at the neutral axis, Apologies now for my drawing. I'm only using that little pad on the on the on the uh, computer. Okay. Okay. So that's your neutral axis. And we know that as we bend something, that the very outside fiber at the top. Uh, so in this beam at the bottom here, the example, the very outside fiber at the top is in uh, is in compression. The very uh, outside fiber at the bottom is in is in tension. So we know. Uh, that then that's the extreme uh, stresses at the top and extreme stress at the bottom. Whereas the neutral axis in the midpoint here in this example, uh, the neutral axis is no stress. So any of those fibers in the middle, um, those fibers of steel in the middle, they don't see any stress whatsoever. Uh, whereas the top ones see the maximum stress, the bottom in uh, in compression, the bottom ones see the maximum stress in, in tension. So that's at A. And then if I unload that, everything recovers. There's no the stress becomes zero. Uh, and everything. So I unload from A back down and I have no stress in any of the fibers uh, whatsoever. So it's all proportion. Um, if I get to point uh, B, uh, then it's a similar thing. What's happening is I'm, I'm increasing the stress in all of the fibers, except obviously it's zero at the middle. Um, so what's happening is the top fibers are getting uh, more and more stressed up until they hit the yield point. So at B is when that, that very, very outside fiber of the, of the steel beam, so whatever is the very, very top fiber, in there, if I think of a wad of paper that I have together, that very top sheet of paper is at yield. In other words, if I um, stretch that any further, uh, it's going to be permanently deformed, that very top sheet of paper, that very uh, top fibers. Uh, whereas the, 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 the next fiber down is a little bit yet less stress, less stress when I get to the middle and the middle sheet of paper in that wad of paper has got no uh, stress in it whatsoever. Uh, I've got a small wad of paper. Okay, so if I take that wad of paper and I bend it over, um, that middle sheet, if I counted all the sheets in the halfway through all the sheets of paper, that middle sheet doesn't feel any stress whatsoever. Whereas the top one uh, naturally wants to slide out, but I'm not going to let it slide out because it's glued to all the other sheets of paper. So therefore it has the maximum uh, compression stress in it. 
So that's a B. And if I keep bending the uh, keep bending the, the beam more and more, uh, then I get to um, a C, which means that not just the outside fiber now has reached the yield stress, but so has the next fibers down and the next fibers down and so on. Uh, by the time I get to uh, D, uh, there's even more fibers have yielded. So I've got nearly every fiber now throughout my section is, has, is at yield point, um, except some of these ones in the middle uh, are still uh, less than yield. And then by the time I get all the way up to E, I'm on the full uh, plastic zone uh, along here. Uh, and it means every single fiber has yielded uh, throughout the, the section. But because we've ended up can get some strain hardening, so we go over to F, there's some strain hardening. So actually some fibers can even withstand some stress that's higher than yield, all the way up to the ultimate. And if we hit the ultimate, that means that piece of that fiber there, uh, that part of the steel is going to fracture uh, and it's going to break. And eventually the whole section will, will break. So that's how it works. So we have to, so the first thing we want to do is classify the, each part of the section. So we want to classify um, the, um, the flanges and the webs, the compression flange and the web uh, in an eye section to see uh, which uh, is, how susceptible is local buckling. Can we get full plasticity or, or is it going to look, or is it going, are we going to get local buckling early? And of course, the more slender an element is, in other words, the length divided by the thickness, the larger that is, uh, then the more susceptible it is to local buckling. Just at any time, if anyone wants to stop me, just put up your hand um, and uh, and you can either type in a, a question or you can uh, turn on your mic and ask me a question. Okay. So on a recap from what we did um, in, in third year in, in CE3103, um, the, the six checks that we're going to do, we did five last year, we're going to do the, the six checks. So assuming that we have lateral, full lateral restraint, that that compression flange isn't going to buckle sideways, uh, then we're going to do six checks. We're going to do the local buckling check, and how we do that is we do the section classification. Then we're going to check uh, for shear and shear buckling um, to make sure that the section capacity is higher than the demand. So the demand uh, is there as a result of the forces that are applied to the beam. Um, and then we have to make sure that the capacity, um, how much uh, stress that the beam can carry uh, before it exceeds its, its strength um, or before it, it uh, deforms excessively. And then we have to check the bending uh, in there to make sure that uh, the capacity in terms of bending is greater than the demand that's on it in terms of bending on any section across the whole length of the beam. And then in some places along the beam, we might have high front and high shear. So we have to check to see um, across, one, across different sections of the beam to see um, are we going to exceed the stress if we look at the, the, the demand on the moment plus the demand on the shear at the same time. So we have to look at the combined moment and shear and make sure that the capacity of the beam to withstand the combination of the moment and shear forces that are on it uh, is higher than the, than the, the capacity is higher than the demand. And then we have to check our serviceability state, and the main one that we check here is deflection to make sure that the beam doesn't uh, deflect uh, too much. And then, as I said, we're going to do a look look at uh, local resistance there to transverse force checks as well to see if we need to put additional plates uh, in there. Okay, so um, so we go to Eurocode three, part one, part one, and uh, if we go on to table five point two. Uh, table 5.2 is uh, will allow us to classify classify the section uh, in there. So, okay. So, um, so on, on sheet one of three, um, we have the parts is to classify the webs first. So we we classify the web. So you can see here there's different uh, section shapes. So typically, what we're going to be using is we're going to be using a roll section, which is this uh, one at the uh, at the at the top left, or and we go on to play curtis, we're going to use the welded section, which is this one here. And you can see that the height, well, if, if you open up the Eurocode yourselves, you will be able to see it, Eurocode 3. You will be able to see that the C is the height from uh, the bottom here the, of the um, of the fillet. So as we start to thicken, all, thick, thicken out around the, uh, the root radius, um, so it's the height from the bottom of the root radius right down to the uh, other root radius. That's the C, that's the unstiffened length, and then here's the thickness. So the... So the, the slenderness of this element is going to be the, the, the unstiffened length, which is C, divided by the thickness. In the case of a, of a welded section, you start from the bottom of the weld. So because the weld has given it a bit of stiffness because there's a bit of extra thickness there. So it's from the bottom of the weld uh, to the bottom of the other weld. Uh, so that's C and then divided by uh, the thickness that gives the slenderness of, this, of the section and so on for box sections. And, and that the images there show you what the uh, C where C is, how you measure C and, and T. 
And then we have uh, the first column in here is the classification. So you can have class one, class two section, uh, class three section, or a class four section. So effectively, um, class, say, three section, the, the C value, so the unstiffened length divided by the thickness, is less than or equal to 124 epsilon, where epsilon uh, is equal to the square root of 235 divided by Fy, where Fy is the nominal yield strength of the material. Uh, and there's a little table here at the bottom of uh, 5.1 where it shows you if we're going to use, say, S275 steel uh, and the yield strength is uh, 275 newtons per millimeter squared, then epsilon is equal to 0.92. So we can put the 0.92 in here uh, and we get 124 times 0.92. So if C over T is less than or equal to that, then it's a class uh, 3 section. But if it's greater than uh, 124 epsilon, then it's a class 4 section. So we started at the top and first and checked to see, um, you know, is this class 1? So class one section being unstiffened length divided by the thickness, if that's less than or equal to 72 epsilon, then we have um, a class one section. So we, again, we go down to the bottom to see what epsilon is. Uh, so if it's S275 uh, of a yield strength, of a nominal yield strength, it's 0.92. Multiply by 72, uh, and that gives us, uh, the, and then we have to check to see if the unstiffened length C divided by T is less than or equal to 72 epsilon. If it is, it's class one section. If it's between 183 uh, and 72 epsilon, then it's a class two section. Or if it's uh, between 124 and 83 epsilon, it's class three section. Or if it's greater than 124 epsilon, it's a class four section. So that's a classification of the web uh, first uh, in there. Uh, and then we need to classify the, the, um, the flange. So the flange is the unstiffened length. So again, we can see uh, from the diagrams here that the unstiffened length is from the, the, the outside edge of the tip of the of the flange right the way to where it kind of starts to stiffen up or thicken up. So just where uh, the fillet radius uh, starts. That's the unstiffened length C uh, divided by T. That's the, that's the value. And the same for a welded section. It starts at the outside edge of the weld uh, out to the very tip. That's C divided by T uh, in there. So we have... Um, we have a class one, class two, or class three section, or, or again, a class four section. So class uh, one section is when the unstiffened length C divided by T is less than or equal to nine epsilon uh, in there. And then if it's between uh, 10 and nine epsilon, then it's a class two section. If it's between uh, 14 epsilon and 10 epsilon, it's a class three section. Uh, and if it's uh, greater than 14 epsilon, it's a class four section. In other words, class four section means that you're going to get local buckling before you can even yield uh, the material in there. So where can we find the C over T uh, ratios? So well, we can find them for the blue book. We can look up the section, whatever section size we choose. We look up the blue book, and then we can find the C over T ratio and check that against uh, the uh, limits that are set within um, table 5.2 in Euro code 3, part 1, part 1. Okay, so to know what the yield strength, the nominal yield strength of the material is, then we go to table 3.1 in Euro code 3, 1.1. Uh, and that gives us the different nominal uh, yield strength in there. So we um, check to see what uh, thickness of section we have. So if the section is uh, less than or equal to 40 uh, millimeters, uh, we use uh, these first two columns. Or if the section is between uh, 40 and 80 millimeters, we use the, the second two columns there. We we uh, see what grade of steel that we use. So typically, uh, I would typically use the first um, rows here. So let's say uh, S275 steel or S355. So if I take S275 steel, uh, then the nominal yield strength uh, of a section that has um, um, the thickness of the flange 40 millimeters is equal to 275 newtons per millimeter squared. And the ultimate strength, uh, so that's the kind of strength where it's going to uh, break or fracture at, is 430 newtons per millimeter squared. Whereas if it's a thicker section, somewhere between 40 and 80 millimeters, uh, then we reduce the yield strength down to 255 uh, and we reduce down the um, ultimate strength to 410. The reason why we do that is because there's higher residual stresses that are built into those sections. The thicker sections would have higher residual stresses as a, uh, as a result of the manufacturing, which reduces down the, the yield strength uh, in there. Okay, so that's the that's the um, yield strength and the ultimate strength we're going to use those in our, in our design. If it's S355, then we'd have, um, at uh, if it's less than 40 millimeters, uh, Thick, sorry, less than or equal to 40 millimeters thick, the element we're looking at, uh, then we have a yield strength of 355 newtons per millimeter squared, uh, where if it's higher is 500, or sorry, if the ultimate is 510 newtons per millimeter squared. 
So that's the Shear Buckton check done, or sorry, the local Buckton check done. So number two then is the Shear and Shear Buckton check after that. So generally, um, Shear does not generally have a, a significant influence on the design of the beams. An exception to this is where we have a high coincident uh, shear and moment occur, such as the internal support. So we have a, a two-span beam here. We have a left support, middle support, and a right support. So this is a pin support, roller support, roller support. And we have a uniform uh, distributed load on top of it. And then we get a shear force diagram that looks like this uh, in here. So we've got a high shear uh, close to those uh, internal supports. Uh, but if we also look at the bending moment diagram, we have sagging in the first uh, in the first span, maximum sagging here. But we have hogging. Uh, over the support and then sagging back down here. So the bottom of the beam, uh, we'll say the underside of the beam here would be in tension uh, and the top side would be in compression. Whereas when we get over the support, uh, the underside is going to be in compression and the top is going to be in uh, in tension because we've got a uh, hogging uh, moment. So we get a high moment and a high shear at the same time. So the part of the beam, if you take an I-beam that uh, resists the shear, is normally the web uh, part. So that's when we work out what the shear area, the part there that's highlighted in red is the is the shear area in it. So that's mainly what we use to withstand the shear stresses. Uh, and then the rest of it we would normally use to carry the, um, the bending. Well, the full webs is what we, sorry, the full flange is what we use to carry the, the bending. So we do the shear check in accordance with clause 6.2.1 in, in the error code. And so with the shear design, of the shear force to carry out the cross section to satisfy uh, this equation, which is effectively the demand divided by the capacity should be less than or equal to one. So the shear design resistance divided by the shear design um, uh, capacity, uh, our plastic resistance should be less than or equal to one, uh, where the plastic resistance uh, is given by the shear area times the nominal yield strength divided by square root of three, all divided by the material factor of safety in there. So Fy divided by uh, root of three. The reason why we have that is because uh, Fy is the nominal yield strength when we actually load a, an element. If we load it in, in shear, the material uh, strength is one over root three, that of um, the, the strength in uh, axial load. Okay, so we have to, so that's why we have uh, that one. So that's basically the shear strength uh, inside the brackets. Multiply by the cross-section area. So area times the stress would give us a force, uh, which is what we have here, divided by the material factor of safety. Uh, and the shear area for the different sections, so we typically use the rolled uh, I section here, um, and we're going to load it the web. So the shear area is equal uh, to this uh, formula uh, at the bottom here. So we can't, uh, we have always, uh, oftentimes with these formulas, we have a limit. Um, so the shear area in this case is the overall area of the section. So we take the we take the overall area of the section, uh, the whole lot of it, which is, you get that from the blue book. So that's A. Then you take away two times B. Um, times uh, TF, so so you have the width of the flange here at the top, the thickness of the flange, so that's you take away all of that area at the top by two, so you take away all the area at the bottom, uh, and then you're going to add back in the thickness of the web, which is this thickness here, plus uh, 2R, uh, so the radius here, the radius here, so the thickness of that, 2R, multiplied by TF, so you're going to uh, add in uh, back in uh, this area uh, in here, and then it should be not less than um, the height of the web, so this is over the height of the web uh, times the thickness of the web, this thickness of the web here, uh, times new, and new is usually taken as one. Okay, so that's the shear area. Um, we have to also check for shear buckling uh, as well, or we have to check to see if we have to go and do detailed calculations on shear buckling. So shear buckling for webs without intermediate stiffness is checked in accordance with 6.2.6 uh, in Eurocode 3, part one, part one, where we have the height of the web divided by the thickness of the web, and um, if that's greater than 72 um, epsilon divided by nu, uh, then we have to uh, do a um, more detailed calculation. Uh, we have to go to section, or sorry, we have to go to Eurocode 3, part 1, part 5. So nu, we normally take it as conservatively as 1. Uh, epsilon is the square root of Fy uh, divided by 235. Um, and um, yeah, so once we're uh, below that limit, then we don't have to check for shear buckling. Uh, if we do have uh, shear buckling, we can actually put in stiffeners there, so we don't have to, so we can uh, make the make the web stiffer, so it doesn't buckle. So section or step three then is to do a combination of moment and and or sorry to do the uh, beam resistance check. So we do the beam resistance check in according to Eurocode three part one part one uh, six clause six point two point five. 
Um, so your equal three is the symbol W for section modulus within the resistance formula. So there's three uh, subscripts. So the plastic, the elastic are the effective uh, sections. Uh, in there, so for the class one section, we use the plastic. Uh, for the class three section, we or sorry, class one or two, we use the plastic. Uh, class three section, we do elastic. Uh, and if it's a class four section where we're going to buckle, uh, a local buckle before we get full uh, elastic uh, capacity, then we use the effective uh, m uh, section modulus in there. So in strength of materials, you would use the uh, flexural formula where you have stress, bending stress is equal to my over i, moment divided or multiplied by the distance from the centroid to the extreme fiber divided by the second moment of area uh, in there. Uh, for design, we're going to, uh, we have Fy, so the yield uh, stress is equal to the uh, moment capacity multiplied by y uh, divided by i. Um, and then if we take that moment, move it around, bring the m over the other side uh, and f over this side, you have um, moment capacity is equal to the yield strength uh, multiplied by i, second moment of area, divided by um, the um, distance in neutral axis. And then that means the section module is just i over y uh, in there. And you can get that section property straight from the blue book. Uh, so that gives us that mc is equal to uh, uh, fy times w. And then we divide that by a material factor of safety uh, in there using the Eurocode uh, convention. So it's a very standard formula, uh, which you get from your strengths and materials uh, in there. Okay, and that's given in 6.2.5 uh, in there, where you have the, again, we have to check always that the, the demand, the moment demand is divided by the capacity is less than or equal to one uh, in there. And that's given in equation 6.12. So we have to satisfy that equation. Uh, and then to get the capacity, uh, in there, we can get the capacity for the class one or class two section. We use the plastic modulus, which we can get from the blue book, multiplied by Fy, material strength, divided by the uh, safety. If it's a class three section, we use the elastic um, modulus, multiplied by the yield strength, divided by the material factor safety. If it's a class four section, we use the effective modulus, uh, multiplied by Fy, divided by gamma m uh, naught. So you can get um, those uh, modulus uh, from the from the blue book. Uh, so it's relatively straightforward, which we would have done in last year's class. Uh, and as I said, you know, it depends which the classification is, one, two, or three. Uh, I'll explain that already. So that's bending. Um, so now once we have the bending check done, if it passes the bending check, then we're going to look at combined uh, moment and shear. So we have a, an easy way of, of doing this, a relatively easy way of doing it. But to look at what it means, uh, here we've plotted on the x-axis the moment or the normalized moment, which is effectively the demand divided by the capacity. Uh, and on the y-axis is the shear demand divided by the capacity. So if we have um, full, um, if the demand in bending is equal to the capacity uh, in bending, then we're at one here. Um, and we have, uh, whereas if we're, uh, if the demand in shear is equal to the capacity in shear, then we're at one. So that gives us the outside edge of it, the outside envelope uh, in terms of capacity. And then we have somewhere then where we have uh, a combination of bending and shear. So we have the, the bending is more than zero here. So here the bending is zero uh, and the shear is at maximum. But then as we start to move up with the bending, increase the bending, then we have less uh, available for shear uh, and all the way as we come up and along. But there's a, if we can see this diagram, we can see that once we're less than 0.5, so once the shear demand divided by the capacity is less than 0.5, we have low uh, shear in there. So we can use the full uh, bending capacity. Uh, in there. When we have high shear, uh, then we have to use some sort of combination uh, in there. So we have to reduce the moment capacity down to take account of the high shear in there. And we can do that using either equation 6.29 or equation 6.30 for I beams in there. So effectively, the first thing we'll do is check to see if we have lower high shear. If the shear demand divided by the capacity is less than 0.5, then we have low shear. And then we don't need to reduce down the bending capacity to take into for, uh, for uh, sorry, we don't down the bending capacity as a result of the shear. However, if we have high shear, then we will have to reduce down um, the uh, capacity of our section to, for bending because, due to that high shear. Okay, so that's uh, set out in, in, in uh, the clause here, according to Ian 1993, part one, part one. Uh, clause 2.8, the effect of the shear on the bending capacity can be neglected uh, when the shear force is half that of the plastic resistance. And if it's uh, greater than 50%, then the following clauses are used. So this is the, the reduction that we have to do. So we have to reduce the moment down. Um, we take the design resistance of the cross section for the moment uh, and then, or of the moment, and then we reduce it uh, down accordingly. And we reduce it using this formula. So effectively, we can see that the demand divided by the capacity in shear. So the higher the demand is relative to the capacity, then the bigger that this number becomes. 
uh, and the bigger that that, that uh, row becomes, the smaller this becomes. And when you multiply that by the moment uh, capacity, then the smaller the overall uh, capacity is for uh, in, in bending uh, due to the high shear. So effectively, the higher the demand here in shear, uh, the bigger uh, row becomes, the bigger row becomes, the smaller this factor becomes, and that's the factor that you multiply by the moment capacity by. So that's, that uh, reduces, so the bigger row is, the more you reduce down the moment capacity, uh, just the higher shear. Okay, so, uh, and then we have the, we put it into the formula here, so the reduced uh, design plastic resistance um, for shear may alternatively be obtained using this. So we either use the, the previous clause, which I showed you, or we can use this one, uh, where you have the plastic um, modulus, uh, and then you have this factor in here uh, afterwards, where we have AW is just the height of the web times the thickness of the web, T is the thickness of the web, and uh, rho is as per uh, calculated in, that I explained in the previous slide. Okay, so that's a uh, combined uh, moment and shear. So the number five, then we're going to check is for deflection. So all the other ones uh, are <clears throat> ultimate limit state um, checks uh, in there, where if you fail those, you might end up causing um, failure um, of the of the section, whereas uh, this is a serviceability limit state, which is a, de a deflection is a serviceability limit state. So excessive defer de serviceability deflections may impair uh, the function of a structure, so it might lead to cracking of plaster, difficult to open doors, maybe cracks of uh, windows and so on. Uh, so deflections are an important aspect of beam design and can often govern the design of the beam. So in serviceability limit state, um, it's not ultimate limit state, so we're meaning we're dealing with the risk of, we're not dealing with the risk of structural collapse. So the other uh, checks that we've done so far are all about um, potential collapse. Uh, this, uh, if we fail this one, we won't collapse, but we might do damage um, to other, other say, non-structural elements, or we might also make the building uncomfortable or maybe not visually as aesthetic, uh, aesthetically pleasing. So consequently, the unfactored uh, load is generally utilized for the beam deflection, uh, like bending or shear checks where we, where we um, use a factored load up. So we have deflection guidelines where um, for cantilevers, the limit will be the length, so the span of the section. So there's a cantilever at the bottom. The span of the section L um, divided by 180 would be um, recommended as a limit. For beams carrying plaster or other brittle material, it's span divided by 360. So any of these span here, L divided by 360. Um, for other beams, it would be span divided by 200. And if there's purlins on sheeting rails, to suit the cladding. So it depends on what the cladding is. And then we've got the standard formulas here for deflection. So if we've got a simply supported beam, uh, where a uniform distributed load at the, uh, across it, the deflection is equal to 5 over 384 omega L squared, uh, L4 over uh, EI. Uh, that's for a um, <coughs> simply supported uh, beam uh, with a uniform distributed load over the top of it. If we have a simply supported beam with a um, sorry, with a point load uh, over the top of it, um, we will then have uh, F uh, L cubed over uh, 48 EI as the uh, as the formula uh, for the deflection, um, and as I said, that the you know the, the loads were taken as unfactored, so we don't factor up the loads. Um, so in the ultimate state, we would take 1.35 times the dead load plus 1.5 times the live load as the factored up loads. In this one, we take unfactored loads, so it would be just the, the dead load, um, or sometimes we just check the deflection under the live load because the windows go in after this deflection has already happened from the from the self weight from the dead load. So we just want to see how much more it's going to deflect. From the people and the equipment and so on uh, that goes in there so we might just check under the live load only uh, and so on so the different formulas there are, are, are there for so that's um <coughs> that's deflection guidelines so what we're going to do is uh um we'll do a on uh, next week i think we'll leave it for today so next week we're going to um do a worked example we're going to um uh, recap ourselves from from last year in terms of design a beam under simply supportive beams Okay, so I'll just uh, stop this recording.